Zambiza, welcome to Pull Off the Chair. It's absolutely, I'm delighted to have you here today. Look, I've heard you talk really powerfully about our ability to create and sustain growth and being one of the biggest challenges of our time. And you talk about this in your books. So I just really want to start by asking you, what does sustainable growth mean to you? Well, thank you, Bean. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I think it's a, it's a wonderful question. Um, I think and actually it's, it frames a lot of what's going on around the world today. So to me, sustainable growth is about creating improvements in living standards, quality of education, healthcare, infrastructure, so general public goods, um, national security, really human progress in a way that actually moves as many people as possible forward without reducing the livelihoods of other people. So in some sense, it's um, not only about inclusiveness, but it's also about being able to create improvements in living standards um, over time from generation to generation, which is uh, proving to be quite difficult. And that's really interesting you say that because the, the context you give is a very long-term vision, right? Which is what I associate with sustainable growth and sustainable, um, you know, outcomes. And I think sometimes um, businesses are grappling with growth, which hasn't got the same sort of time horizon. So I know you've talked about um, aligning business economic growth with societal needs, which is effectively what you're saying there. And we know business and government has a role to play in the societal Absolutely. improvement. Could you just really um, give me some sort of sense of where you think business can really step up here? Well, <coughs> I think th th it's sort of in, uh, in two parts. Um, and I think the, the fact that we've uh, rec in recent times dealt with a global pandemic, we've dealt with a financial crisis, um, we are currently dealing with a conflict and geopolitical fissures, um, should really be a reminder of the important role that corporations play. Um, the two parts being not just in risk mitigation, um, but also in, in, in investing and innovation. Um, I think too often, um, and this is probably, uh, if I were to shorthand it, too often um, certain regions are known for risk mitigation. So um, I, again, just to shorthand it, I think in general, people worry about climate being an area where there's been so much focus on risk mitigation, capping uh, greenhouse gases, all very important and crucial stuff. But um, what that has meant is that businesses have uh, leaned into risk, um, but have maybe um, deprioritized the important aspects of investment. Um, I'm giving climate as one example, but I think there's a broader context um, in areas of inequality, in areas of pursuing growth, where we've become far too risk mitigation fo focused and far too, uh, too, far too little emphasis on uh, thinking about growth and innovation and, and particularly investment um, as being an important piece for, for long-term sustainability. So thank you for that, because that really does bring together the gift that business has to create sustainable growth. You're absolutely right. I think there's been a lot of focus on risk mitigation and compliance and making sure we're just doing what we need to do, as opposed to looking beyond and saying, how can we really drive change? Um, but with that backlog of a challenging environment, which we are in and we have to come through, what do you think the biggest barriers are for businesses to achieve sustainable growth outside of the innovation piece? So um, frankly, I think that, um, I think in the immediate term, uh, we tend to focus a lot on, on tactics and not enough on strategy. Um, and I think that is, is, is problematic. And I think um, by tactics, I mean, there's a tendency, and by the way, not just for, for corporations and, and global um, uh, agencies like NGOs, but I think also government uh, is rewarded for short-term thinking. Um, and there's been a lot written about this, and we know about that discussion. But those tactics tend to focus on the here and now, um, and almost emergency reaction to, you know, pandemics or inflation um, or, or global crises. Um, and not enough is done about thinking about sustainable growth in a sort of structural, long-term, systemic way. Um, and you know, as a, as a consequence. Of, uh, of this problem, this short-term thinking, which again has been very much identified and discussed over time. Um, I think you find that regulation 
tends to be very reactionary. Um, I think the manner in which businesses operate, the way capital is allocated, um, also tends to be very short term in terms of its, its thinking. Uh, and, and this is not to say that there hasn't been a lot of effort in the corporate boardroom or even um, uh, in government to try and extend how people think through things like compensation uh, metrics being a much longer term um, as an example. But I do think fundamentally the big problem that we face um, globally with regards to achieving sustainable growth is that we're always, um, whether it's government, private sector, NGOs, thinking about the immediacy and really not thinking about investing into the long term. We talk about, you talk about purpose as being the golden thread, right? And it's really important. And you've got some, you know, incredible roles across the world in multinational companies. I'd like to understand how, from your experience, how important a strong purpose has been to the businesses you've worked with? Yes, absolutely central. Um, yeah. In fact, perhaps it's no surprise that I've ended up being in the board, boardrooms in which I serve or in the corporations and business, um, but also in public policy uh, in the areas that I, found, uh, that, that I found myself in. It's not a surprise because um, I, I'm, I was born and raised uh, in a poor emerging market. Um, today, 90% of the world's population lives in the emerging markets. Um, and, and as far as I'm concerned, you know, notwithstanding concerns around deglobalization and schisms between the US and China, for example, fundamentally we are interconnect interconnected. We're interconnected in trade, we're interconnected in uh, immigration, we're interconnected in terms of capital flows and clearly with the most recently with the global pandemic, um, but it, also with the war in Ukraine, um, there's more evidence that we are highly interconnected, whether it's through disease, burdens, but also um, through prices, global prices such as food and fuel. Um, and so with respect to your question around purpose, um, it feels to me that the organizations and also that includes government, but also uh, the, the third sector, the, the, the NGO sector, um, as we try to address some of the biggest headwinds that the global economy, uh, but the world uh, is facing, I think it's really important for us to, to understand that purpose and this need, at least in my uh, uh, perspective, this need for human progress is really uh, central and really important to continue to think about, not just in an isolated way, but to really remind ourselves of the interconnectedness and this purpose of trying to improve living standards and leave the world in a better place than, than we find it. Uh, you, you touch on something that's quite is really important, right? You talk about the world. You talk about 90% of the population living in emerging markets. And I think sometimes when we think about growth and sustainable, it's very local, domestic. But you talk about the interconnectedness of trade as well. So as businesses are thinking around growth in an inclusive way, I love your terminology, human progress, in the broadest sense. How do you see them really dealing with and, and facing into those competing challenges of the environment, which we know, you know, people, planet, and, you know, and profits are the, the, uh, the environment, the societal and the financial. How do you feel that they will face into that? So I, I really like that question. And I, I think it's a, um, a wonderful, the, the climate uh, issues that we have addressed uh, or that we're facing right now, questions around the energy transition, I think are, uh, is a great, example, very emblematic of the tensions that um, businesses face, but also society uh, continues to face. There are many others, things like globalization, things like inequality. But I, um, let, me, let me pursue the question of climate. Um, so we are globally with about over 8 billion people in the world today. We are consuming 100 million barrels of energy uh, every single day, 100 million barrels. And even the most aggressive efforts um, for uh, thinking about uh, um, sort of uh, climate change efforts, sort of uh, zero, uh, net zero targets for 2050, even those aggressive e uh, efforts, things like from the uh, International uh, Energy Agency, still uh, point to a very large proportion of energy um, being from uh, traditional conventional sources such as fossil fuels. So why am I raising this? I'm raising this point because even something like climate, where we can see the headwinds, we can see the, the costs, um, needs a cool-headed approach um, to address the fact that there's not a, an easy solution 
um, given the fact that we still want to continue to provide improvements in living standards for people around the world. So from a business perspective, um, I think very often one of the challenges that has emerged in COP26 and 27, and will be discussed, I imagine, in COP28 um, in, uh, in uh, UAE next year, um, is really this question, or this year rather, um, is really this question of um, can we try to solve the climate agenda without creating a schism between developed and developing eco economies? So there's no doubt about the climate change is real. But if corporations, particularly in the West, pursue climate change or energy transition in a way that leaves emerging markets offside or makes the cost of, uh, of the transition too expensive for people uh, in poor countries to adopt, then we're not going to solve this problem of, of climate change. Um, and so we need to bring everybody onto the sort of the same page and doing that requires a much more sensible um, and much more realistic approach to dealing with this, albeit in an aggressive way. I love the way that you articulate the role of the collective and so you, you, know, you talk about the developing and the developed and we've seen that come through in the COP conversations. What parallels, I mean, so what I'm trying to understand is how does business really lean into this? Because government can set the fight framework, the policies, um, but how does business really lean into this challenge and think beyond its own sphere of influence, but the, the bigger sphere of influence, yeah. it really can make a difference? Yeah, so, and, and again, wonderful question. I'm, I'm very fortunate I'm able to straddle um, business, but also uh, what I call the public sector, so that, that's government, but also the NGO sector. Um, and I would shorthand it as, as the following. I think uh, in general, government and the third sector are really very focused on risk mitigation. I touched on this earlier. And that's an incredibly important role. They want to make sure that society doesn't fall apart. We don't have these externalities or second order negative effects that impact the economy or society or human conditions, um, things that maybe we have not even costed as yet. So climate is a great, is a great example. For many decades, people said, well, we've, we're growing at 4%. But actually, if you did include the cost of climate, we might not have been growing at 4%. We might be growing far lower, maybe not even growing at all. Um, so in that respect, we do need risk mitigation, and I think government and the private se uh, public sector uh, agencies tend to be very good at thinking about regulation, thinking about, uh, about um, uh, curbing those, uh, those costs. Um, but you ask me about what the role of business is. I would argue that the role of business should be to invest. Um, and that's not to invest in a careless or in a uh, un, un sort of sophisticated way. Um, in other words, they should be they should recognize costs and of, of uh, decisions that they make and investments. But at the same time, they really should be leaning in um, in terms of innovation. They should be leaning in, in in terms of being a partner for government to try and improve living standards. Um, if I can just push the idea a little bit further, let's stick with climate. So um, there's no doubt about it. Government, I think, should be uh, leaning in in areas such as greenhouse gas emissions, thinking about how we can transition to this new equilibrium uh, without continuing to harm not just society writ large, but also individual uh, living standards. Um, but at the same time, uh, we expect or we should expect corporations to do a lot more in terms of replacing those, uh, those uh, externalities or negative costs. I want to see more investment in wind, in solar, in biofuels, in uh, nuclear Gen 4, uh, more innovation in thinking about what works um, in, a, in a profit lens, but at the same time, what does work sustainably for society. Those two things um, should come together, but we can't, I don't think, have uh, an effective society where all that businesses is doing is, is thinking about risk mitigation and not really investing. Um, and so the good news is that there's a lot of investment happening, um, nowhere near as much as we'd like to see, but this is a science problem. And so with science problems, it takes time, it takes effort, it takes R&D. Um, and I think that's where we should be encouraging uh, corporations to lean in and not just think about risk mitigation. I think that's such an important topic you've just raised, right? So the partnership between government and business to make the change. 
but the role of business to invest. And we're beginning to see, right, businesses collaborate, Absolutely. collaborate with each other, collaborate with academic institutions to accelerate that pace of innovation. Mm -hmm. And the, the challenge is to hold your nerve and keep that moving at a pace because the pace we need it to move at is going to be increasingly demanding Absolutely. as we look forward. And, and, and maybe if I may just add on, you know, it, climate is just one yeah, example. Yeah. Um, we've just come out of a pandemic. We needed the government to put in measures to mitigate or risk mitigate for the, the sort of uh, uh, expansion or the, the bigger risks of, of the pandemic. But at the same time, we also need the private sector to come up with real solutions through investing in vaccinations, doing testing, doing analysis to see what works and what doesn't. So those two things must go hand in hand. We can't just do one and expect uh, a good longer term outcome. Absolutely. The risk reward absolutely has to be balanced. And that's really that's really interesting because it sets the context where we want to go next. Mm -hmm. We've talked about business and what business can do. But what will help business is the governance structures, the boards that actually direct those businesses. So I just want to turn to one of your um, one of your more recent topics in terms of books uh, about boards. What I'd love to explore, if you would share it with us, is the concept of balancing financial shareholder needs versus stakeholder capitalism, and how can boards really think and balance those competing, but not competing. They aren't competing because we all want the end game, which is a better society uh, and, and a successful society. How do we help boards do that better? So um, I would say s relatively slowly <laughs> as, opposed to, <laughs> as opposed to charging out. Um, and what do I mean by that? I actually serve on the Oxford University Endowment. So I do have a very good appreciation of long term um, uh, and, and that tension between long term needs um, of society yeah. versus uh, the sort of immediate uh, desires of, of a, tr a traditional business. Um, I think there's a lot that comes out of your question. Um, you know, first of all, I say slowly, I'm, I'm not suggesting that we do nothing or we sort of navel gaze about it, but I, what I am saying is that we need to be much more thoughtful um, and not just jumping from uh, sort of pillar to post on, on some of these issues that we all get excited about in the, in, the, uh, in, in the interim, but then longer term we lose momentum or we decide to, to uh, pursue something else. Um, there are costs to these decisions, um, you know, uh, very sort of poignantly, uh, you know, we've spent the last sort of five years on a, a very, very clear hobby horse around ESG, uh, rightly so, reaffirming, re reassessing the important role um, that E, S, and G um, are not just for business, but for society. Um, the Business Roundtable in 2019, reaffirming, re rejigging um, their, their mandate. Um, but without a sort of level-headed, uh, sort of careful assessment of how we do these things, we end up with the risks uh, as we have, for example, with the oil price uh, going up because of the war and realizing that many countries are heavily exposed because there's been a lack of investment uh, in traditional energy um, and there's been a lack of investment uh, in refining, um, which, you know, like it or not, uh, as we transition in the energy transition, we still need those uh, investments to, to be made. And the consequences uh, obviously um, are, uh, are quite uh, being felt uh, as, as we know uh, today. Um, but you're right that this focus around, uh, uh, about, around culture, around um, societal responsibility remains a centerpiece of, of what businesses uh, and I should, ar I should argue, I don't think this is a new thing. I think it's just repackaged. If you go back in history, Henry Ford in the 1930s talked about the need to make sure that his own workers, but society was also progressing because ultimately in a very utilitarian way, those are the people who are going to be buying his cars. But, you know, go back to the Quaker roots of Barclays Bank. Um, the, the whole essence of the corporate entity was not just to be sort of greedy and, and short term about things. It was about community and society progressing alongside. So to me, profit and uh, progress um, for society were not sort of these two split um, sort of competing things. They were one and the same. Um, a company that uh, was doing well 
uh, needed the community to be doing well and vice versa. The community also needs uh, business to be doing well so that we can have good jobs and we can have improvements in, in wages and living standards. Um, you know, but clearly, a lot has been written. I think over the years, um, unfortunately, business has come offside uh, from from what uh, you know what what sort of the messaging uh, should be uh, around the role that uh, uh, business plays for for progress. Um, I think that that is changing. Again, we've seen companies step up during the pandemic, um, but I do uh, think that there was a lot of work that needs to be done in reminding people that uh, the role of, of business is, is beyond just short-term uh, sort of profit motivations. And that's where the board's role um, does take a, a very big uh, share of, of, of certainly my job. Um, and maybe just one last thing. I think the other tension is that a lot of corporations, the mandate that you were talking about earlier um, is a legal mandate. Um, and so, for example, in the United States with a, a Delaware LLC, legislation says that the role of the board is to primarily focus on financial shareholders. Um, and, and I think very naturally over time, that did mean there was a hierarchy um, between financial shareholders versus um, society versus uh, other, uh, other needs um, uh, for the community. Um, but I think even that has been, is being superseded by what we're actually doing in these boardrooms. So we understand that there's much more nuance that's required. Um, and dare I say it, even Milton Friedman, who gets sort of thrown out uh, with the baby in the bathwater, as they say, um, I think has been slightly misinterpreted. If you read his whole statement from 1970, he does say that the role of the, the board, um, and particularly the role of the corporation, should evolve with the needs of society. So I think there's never really been this stark dichotomy um, that, that maybe people um, think about business. I think you're absolutely right. I think some of the gritty challenges that we're all facing into a civil society as business, as, as governments, are such long-term difficult things and they're gritty that it goes outside the term or view that we would ordinarily have. And I know, I know we do quite a lot of things together and you've already talked about, you know, the thing that is likely to sink a company is not identifying those risks in the longer term that are outside our immediate purview and immediate sphere of um, delivery or expectation. Um, I just wanted to pick up on the culture point you made. Culture is really important to me as well. We talk about, you know, culture is a amalgam of our behaviors, which are really driven by our values. Right. And you talked about Barclays, you talked about the alignment of values around community, purpose and therefore delivering profit. Can I ask you a little, can I ask you what values you think are really important to get us through the next sort of period of 20, 30, 40 years? Um, honesty. Honestly, the answer is honesty. Um, I think that because it, it sounds almost banal to say that. But I do fear that we're in a world where people are not being honest, um, uh, by and large, because um, we are in a, a period where the optics or how you package something um, is, is perhaps more important than what the reality is. Um, I gave you the example of climate change. Um, I, as I said, I have not yet met somebody who's, who doesn't believe yeah. that, um, that there's an urgent and large uh, headwind uh, around climate that we're dealing with, you know, right now. Um, but I think it would be wrong, and I think it is wrong, for anyone who's trying to really solve this problem in a sustainable way um, to ignore the reality, the truth, the honest fact that we are consuming 100 million barrels of energy every day, and that the choices that we make, um, you know, if we do them in a sort of haphazard way, could actually really harm uh, a lot of people. Um, it could have knock-on effects for migration. It could make people's living standards deteriorate um, in, a, in a very meaningful way. So that's one example. I can give you lots of other examples, certainly in the economics realm, um, of how this lack of honesty about what we're really contending with. And really, when I say honesty, ultimately it's about trade-offs. We can't have everything. Um, and so what are we willing to trade off as, as society? And I think, unfortunately, because of the, uh, the sort of uh, uh, um, 
need to satiate your know, people. Everybody thinks yeah. we can have everything now, you know, as soon as possible, um, and really losing that perspective about the fact that these things are trade-offs. Uh, in economics uh, 101, we used to talk about guns and butter. You don't want a society that has only guns because then you'd starve, for de starve to death. You also don't want a society that only has butter, the, being a euphemism for food, um, because then you could be invaded by your enemies. Um, and so really the role of government and society, including business, should be trying to find that right balance. Um, and this is, you know, this is not great, uh, great stakes. I think most, m most people who are interested in these areas will understand that they're trade-offs. Um, but again, I think the biggest challenge that we have is, is honesty, having a place where business, uh, NGOs, and government can sit down together in a, in a very honest way to say, we have these urgent problems, inequality, uh, demographic shifts, uh, growth, technology, and the risk of a, uh, of a, of a jobless underclass the rise of China, um, in liberal states, etc. We have all these challenges, um, but realistically, let's be very honest about what we're going to have to trade off. Um, and I think so honesty uh, in and out of the boardroom is really important. I love that, honesty, because honesty for me translates to trust. And, you know, and we see businesses today, tr you know, tra being transparent. And if they're transparent and then unable to deliver something, like you say, it's not the short term gain. The decisions that boards are making today are going to have an impact beyond the tenures of those individuals in those boards, right? Um, so I want to come turn to one other thing that you've, you've got a really good perspective on, is the type of leaders that we need. And it's not that, you know, we do, it, it's radically different to what we've had before, but how do you see leadership style or leadership traits or qualities being different as we look forward to face into this really gritty, you know, challenge in, that we're trying to face into? Um, so it's, uh, your questions are great because uh, I think a lot of this is, is uh, um, a lot of these questions are areas that are, are very live. We're dealing with, I certainly dealing with them in boardrooms, but uh, you know, other people are dealing with them in different contexts. And maybe just to give an example to illustrate what you, to answer your question in a sort of roundabout way, um, I recently was chatting to a, a CEO, um, millennial, um, who said to me, you know, Dambisa, for all the time that I've been CEO, which has been several years, um, you, you told me this last year, he said, I've actually never had, um, I didn't, I've not had many problems to deal with. I mean, this is, he was talking about um, before the pandemic. And he said, you know, in, an, in a world where the economy is growing nicely, they don't seem to be these massive geopolitical fissures, um, you don't have a war, you don't have inflation, you don't have a pandemic, it was very easy um, to, in a, in a way, coast. You didn't have to um, be aggressive in how you managed uh, your, your, your employees or how you uh, thought about capital. Interest rates were low, so you could basically borrow and, you know, take chances and punts. Um, you also, did, you know, thinking about uh, areas of productivity, who you engaged with around the world, there weren't that many risks. Um, he said, I just don't know how to operate in a world where, um, you know, we're going to have to make tough decisions about how to allocate capital and think about labor. Um, we're in a world where there's a, a breakdown in trust, um, you know, things like supply chains are being disrupted, etc. I just don't know. And this is his, his point. I don't know how you uh, think about that. And it, it's an interesting thing because my answer to him was, well, you have to kind of experience these things in order to learn. And so, you know, you ask me, <laughs> uh, you know, what are the, the traits of, of a, a leader, um, a good leader in the world that's coming? I think it's somebody who's incredibly flexible. Um, you know, I've worked with board members um, to hire CEOs when we hired the CEO, the mandate was very narrow. We want you to come in. Um, we're happy with the number of employees that we have. We've got a great business. The person takes on the seat and all of a sudden there's a pandemic. Um, all of a sudden there's a war. The prices are extremely volatile, uh, if, especially if you're a price taker um, business. Um, so what the CEO was managed to do, or the environment, the backdrop that they thought they were coming into, where they thought maybe they would be able to borrow lots of money, do some R&D, do some innovation, is very different. Interest rates are higher now. You've got inflation. How do you think about that environment? 
Um, and so, uh, you know, I actually despise the word agile because I think it's way overused. But in a sense, you de do need somebody who's flexible enough to say, gosh, you know, I now have to think about how to run a business, a global business in a pandemic. Um, I thought the cost of capital would be X. It's actually X plus, you know, 200 basis points. Um, I thought that I could build my products cheaply in China and ship them over to the UK. That's gone. I thought that we wouldn't have Brexit. We do. Um, that's just a reality. So how do I think about these very emergent things that I have very little control over, uh, the exogenous factors that are coming at me? Um, and so it really is about, uh, about having those types of uh, very uh, sort of uh, uh, dynamic leaders who are curious and who are willing to, to change direction very quickly. Um, you know, uh, uh, there's been a lot written, Harvard Business Review, there's an article that I talk about um, this idea of having a, a peacetime versus a wartime leader. You know, from the board, you hire in a CEO to address a certain type of situation. If you feel like you need to reduce the costs burden of an organization, you'd hire much more of a, what they call a wartime leader, somebody who knows how to cost to uh, restructure and, and realign costs. Um, if you're in a low interest rate environment and there's a real opportunity for innovation, you'd hire somebody they'd call more of a peacetime type of business. But what happens if you've hired a peacetime CEO and all of a sudden you're in wartime conditions, you need somebody who's going to be able to adapt. So long-winded way of saying that I think uh, adaptability and being able to understand how quickly dynamics change um, and not sitting there thinking, oh, it's going to be fine, so, oh, it's going to be the same, but really leaning into change, I think, is the kind of leaders that we need. And I'm really pleased you said that because coming from a restructuring background myself, <laughs> working in a world of ambiguity, you know where you need to get to, but there is also lots of moving parts, which is exactly where we're in. So I think that sums it up really nicely, being flexible, being agile, because we actually don't know what's going to hit us tomorrow, but you exactly. need to be open-minded to move but with a clear vision of where you're heading. Yeah. Um, with that clear vision in mind, as a, an economist, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you um, how optimistic you feel around, well, the UK economy um, and the global economy over the coming period. Yeah, so it's interesting because people um, in different environments ask me about a, a local region. So sometimes if I'm in the US, they'll say, what do you think about the US economy? And then what do you think about the global economy? If I'm in Asia or in Africa, people ask me about their economy and then the global economy. I see them everything as interlinked. Um, and, uh, and I think, um, you know, for a number of reasons, uh, we've talked about trade and, and immigration and capital flows and all these things is being interlinked. Um, therefore, it just it seems to me quite unnatural to expect a country to be doing phenomenally well where the rest of the world is, is in, in a challenge or vice versa. So maybe um, I'll, I'll cheat a little bit and put, uh, I'll answer in, 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 uh, in uh, sort of together as opposed to splitting them out. Um, look, I, I published a book called Edge of Chaos in 2018 where I outlined a number of structural problems Nothing surprising, Bina, I know you would recognize all of them, but structural problems that the global economy was dealing with at that time. Things like technology and the risk of a jobless underclass, the fact that technology was moving at such a pace, we were losing jobs, what were we going to do with uh, relatively uh, large populations of people who did not have work? Um, demographic shifts. When I wrote that book, we were at seven and a half, maybe higher, 7.8 billion people. You now know from the United Nations report from last uh, September, October, we're now over 8 billion people. Um, you know, when I wrote the book, uh, you know, China was the largest economy. There's now evidence that India is the largest economy. Uh, I talked about inequality, um, not just uh, inequality between countries, um, developed and developing countries, for example, but also within countries, inequality was becoming a problem. Um, natural resources, not just natural resource scarcity, but also the stuff we've been talking about earlier about climate and how do we transition um, from a heavily uh, a conventional uh, energy base to a new base, and also a headwind. How do we do that in a way, uh, you know, we've seen the evidence of CO2 emissions continuing to get bigger, even though we were all at home under quarantine. This is a real headwind. Um, debt, the sheer amount of debt the global economy is carrying, productivity declined. So there are all these headwinds. Um, since I wrote that book, we've had a global pandemic. I didn't even talk about a global pandemic at that time. And we now have a, uh, a war. 
certainly in Europe. Um, to my mind, these things are catalyzing the problems that I outlined in a structural way. So what does that mean? It means that I'm not as um, euphoric uh, as I would like to be uh, about uh, the, the trajectory or the path of the world. Um, the, the, the rule of thumb that I use, uh, I've used quite a bit, is that in order to double per capita incomes, and again, I'm an economist, my PhD is in economics, so I tend to focus on economics, um, but um, in order to double per capita incomes in one generation, a generation is 25 years, we need to be growing by 3% per year. Um, and you just look around the world today, um, many countries are not growing anywhere near 3%. In fact, as you know, forecasting a recession um, for this year. So we're on, I would argue, we're on a fundamentally uh, a not on the right path. Um, there are things that we hadn't planned for, like the war, like inflation, um, that have, uh, you know, some people say that they're very much linked, um, ideological fissures, all these things we hadn't really planned for. Um, and I, I don't see those things going away in the interim, which leaves me with a, a very sort of unsettled um, perspective. Um, maybe just one other thing. We now have over about 100 million refugees and displaced people, the highest on record according to the International Resource uh, Committee, uh, sorry, Refugee Commit uh, Committee. So we've got a lot of these problems. Um, I'm generally an optimist. Um, the question ultimately is what can we be, what should we be doing about this? Uh, I hope that we're now in a, a place where things have gotten to such fever pitch that we are going to come together. Uh, and by coming together, I mean across countries. Um, we can't solve these problems by keeping China offside, for example. But I also think it's important for us to come together, business, um, public sector, as well as, as NGOs, to, as I said, be honest about what, these, what we're really contending with and coming up with real solutions. So I'm afraid I'm not uh, that sanguine, but um, you know, as, uh, as I, my mother always says, we put a man on the moon, I think we can, uh, we can solve poverty and we can solve these problems if we uh, really lean into them in an honest way. So, Jambisa, maybe you could sort of leave us some, with some optimism about what we can see or expect to see as we look forward. Yeah, and I think the word optimism is really important because the purpose of um, identifying problems or identifying economic headwinds or societal headwinds is not for us to just navel gaze and throw our hands in the air and say, well, gosh, it's really awful. It's really to come up with more innovation um, and real opportunities to address these uh, these challenges. Um, I actually remain optimistic. I think there are lots of reasons we should be optimistic. We're living in a, an era of in, immense speed up of uh, technology. Just to pick on technology, the ability for technology, not just to create networks uh, like a Facebook or to, uh, to improve consumerism like an Amazon, but really to uh, append public goods like education and healthcare. Uh, access and quality for people around the world is, is immense. And I think we should be excited about that um, and that prospect. And so, um, you know, I'd, I don't want to be sort of Pollyannish about it, as they say, but I want to be, um, to, to say that, you know, the, the reason we identify these problems is to help us um, to, uh, to come up with the right solutions to accelerate sustainable growth um, and to improve uh, progress for all. And I think you've given everybody, everybody listening to this podcast some real food for thought about the mindset required to take us through. So that's been incredible. Um, I just want to talk a little bit about you, if that's OK. Uh, incredibly accomplished author, businesswoman and now Baroness. Um, if you could go back in time to the young Dr. Dambiza, well, as she would have been before then, Dambiza, what, would you, what advice would you have given yourself? I think I would have told myself that uh, something somebody said to me, no doesn't mean never, it means not now. And I really like that because, you know, um, my best friend is the is a chairman of, of Starbucks, and she and I joke about how, um, you know, when we show up in a, on a podcast or in an interview or in a boardroom, it looks fully packaged but there have been a lot of no's and a lot of disappointments along the way that you know, maybe the outside just doesn't see. And, and yet, looking back, um, those no's, the times when the door was slammed in, in my face, certainly, um, were not really to say it's never going to happen. It was just you weren't, I wasn't ready. Um, and, and perhaps I needed, more, I needed to be more patient or more understanding that I needed better skills, I needed to have better experiences. And I needed to lean into curiosity and to continuing to learn. 
to have those opportunities become yeses. Um, and so I think too often, particularly in the world that we're in right now, and I'm obviously, I'm over 50, so I'm in a different generation, but I worry a lot that uh, people want things and they want them now. And uh, if you say no, then, oh my gosh, it must mean that I'm, you're, you're a racist or you're anti-woman or without really understanding that there's a process um, I think, uh, and, and um, by the way, just to be clear, I'm not saying that uh, misogyny and racism don't exist. I'm just saying that uh, you know it, it's a, it's a dangerous place for for the individual, but for society, I think if people um, don't understand that there's a process to learning, um, and there will be setbacks and disappointments, and that just because somebody said no, I'm not giving you this job, or no, I'm not giving you a promotion, um, doesn't mean that it's never going to happen. Um, and I think it's often the onus is on us to say, okay, you've told me no, what do I need to do to be eligible? So no doesn't mean never, it just means not now. It's a lovely way <laughs> to articulate the importance of resilience. Yes. You know, we talk about resilience as being bouncing back, but it is about not bouncing back to something that's necessarily the negative. It's exactly. about how do I get to the exactly next Exactly right, exactly yeah. right. Lovely, lovely bit of advice there. Um, we've been talking about sustainable growth and we've looked at it in the broadest sense possible from an economic, societal, um, and environmental. How do you sustain yourself? Because I know you're a very, very busy lady, so how do you sustain yourself? Well, I don't know what you mean. Do you mean, well, how <laughs> do, do, I you, go to, you, do I go to the gym every day, or do you mean like, do I uh, intellectually, how do I stimulate my, how, what do you How mean? do you keep yourself so grounded and yeah. sane? Because you do a lot, right? You, you're in, you know, you've got many roles, but how do you keep yourself energized and motivated? Yeah, so um, I, for me, the most important thing is, uh, believe it or not, actually, I like to spend time with people who are much older than I am. Um, some people will say that's probably why I've ended up in the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think having, uh, really pursuing relationships with people who are in their 80s, um, older than that, has been really beneficial for me. And uh, it might sound like, how does that sustain you? It does, because I do think that there's always a historical context. Um, there's a lot of information that is lost if you don't read. I read a lot. Um, and so, the, the uh, and, and more and more I'm reading history because I do think, gosh, there's a lot of patterns, a lot of things, a lot of learnings um, that get lost in because we think we're here and now, and this must be the first time this ever happened. No, it's not. And so how did past generations learn? But spending time with older people, for me, has been incredibly valuable. And it might be um, just because, you know, I was born and raised in Africa. Uh, and in Africa, there's a lot of reverence for older people. Um, they have so much wisdom. They have so much perspective. They understand uh, how you should be investing your time, I think, and the networks and sort of uh, societal uh, relationships you should be building um, at, at whatever age you're, you're at. And so um, I, that's how I sustain myself. They're, they encourage curiosity. Um, they, I think there's a, a lot of, um, uh, I, I would, you know, right now I'm quite obsessed with this whole idea of mixed uh, mental models with Charlie Munger. I get another, you know, I think he's going to be 100. I just turned 100 years old. Another Lots of uh, fount of wisdom, um, but this idea that um, when you look at a problem, don't just look at it from one lens. So in my case, don't just look at it from economics. Um, think about the same question from a biological thread or anthropological lens or uh, you know p political science or other areas. So this idea of mixed mental models, it, to me, it's it's very fascinating. I'm getting very sustained by that right now and trying to really challenge my. Uh, beliefs and, and understanding. So um, that's that's what I would say. I'm not surprised, Debbie, because you're a <laughs> lifelong learner. You are I a lifelong to learner. <laughs> but I can relate to that reverence to elders, that fast forwarding of the wisdom yes. and experiences that come from uh, times and situations that can sometimes be harsher than the ones that we're facing into. So Dan Beezer, it's been absolutely fascinating talking you. to you. We've, we've just covered so much and it's been an incredibly interesting, broad ranging conversation. We started off around that core human, uh, the core purpose around human progress and the role of society, business and, and government in you know, that longer term you know, talent. You know, how do you manage that tension between long term, short term, risk, 
investments. But the three words I'm going to take away from this interview, I think really, really resonate. The interconnectedness, it's not just a geographical thing, it, it is a stakeholder thing as well. The second is honesty, which to me goes back to the heart of trust and transparency to actually get to the same place in the end. And then the third, which I think all of us can do, and comes back to your very last point, is that flexibility of thinking, flexibility of approach and openness to dealing with things in a way that we're not necessarily always used to. Yeah, absolutely. It's we don't know. We don't know we is don't the bottom know. line. We don't. we don't. We all may think we know, but we don't. And so I think having that, coming to problems and challenges with yeah. that attitude is, is much more healthy. This has been absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Thank you. I really enjoyed being here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.